Hi everyone, welcome to CESC. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to talk about my work um, at this uh, really incredible conference. So I am, um, my name is Deeksha Gupta. I'm a professor uh, of finance at Carnegie Mellon University. And the paper that I'm gonna talk about is co-authored with Itai Goldstein and Ruslan Shirkov, uh, who are both at the Wharton School. And we're interested um, in this paper in initial coin offerings and we're going to talk about a mechanism where tokens that are sold in initial coin offerings are essentially a way for entrepreneurs to commit to competition and giving up monopoly rents. So there's um, an open question of what the future of initial coin offerings is going to be. Um, the ICO market really um, grew rapidly from 2016 through the beginning of 2018. There was a lot of excitement about this market. Um, proponents of ICOs were wondering if they were going to replace the big technology giants of the time, if they were gonna disrupt the venture capital market. And we saw a lot of activity in the ICO market. Um, so this market really grew rapidly from 2016 through the beginning of 2018. Um, to give you just a sense of some numbers, in 2016, 52 initial coin offerings raised about 283 million, so a very small market at the time. And in 2018, really less than two years later, um, over 3,800 ICOs raised close to $30 billion. It was almost 90% of the size of the initial public offering market that year. So there's this huge flurry in ICO activity and it was really exciting. But then in the beginning of 2018, the activity started slowing down. So here I'm just showing you a graph um, from the Token Alliance, which is um, uh, essentially graphing the number of successful ICO projects. So the number of ICO projects that raised at least $25,000 in funding. And you notice that you know there's this big increase in activity from 2016 to 2018, but starting in 2018, we see almost as dramatic a fall in the number of ICOs and the market virtually disappears in 2019. So the future of initial coin offerings is quite uncertain. Um, so they are, um, some people are incredibly negative about the market. They have been labeled as scams. The 2017-2018 period is described as a bubble. Um, so there's this question of, is there any future for this market? Is there a use case to be made for initial coin offerings? Or was this simply just a bubble? And in this paper, we're going we're, um, we show that utility tokens, which are essentially the bread and butter of initial coin offering markets, can improve the efficiency of two-sided marketplaces with network effects. And essentially, this is because tokens or utility tokens, the type that are typically issued in initial coin offerings, can actually help entrepreneurs commit to giving up monopoly and oligopoly rents and to um, competitive pricing of services on their platforms. So what do I mean when I say two-sided marketplaces with network effects? Um, essentially, I'm thinking about here about marketplaces which can match buyers and sellers. So you essentially have buyers who are looking to purchase a good or service. You have many sellers who are looking to sell that good or service. And this is a platform that matches the two. The idea is that to make this matching really efficient, you ideally want a large number of buyers and a large number of sellers. Right? So these are natural monopolies and oligopolies, the matching kind of matching the two because they're network effects of having sort of a large number of buyers and a large number of sellers. And a lot of sort of big companies and applications that probably we all use can be characterized as being two-sided marketplaces with network effects. So think about Uber, Lyft, Airbnb. So what is generating monopoly power here? Essentially for matching kind of buyers and sellers, it's quite efficient to have a single platform that does this. 
So think about ride sharing apps. If you're looking for a ride, um, you don't want to download a hundred different ride sharing applications and open up all of them when you need a ride, comparing the prices and waiting times across them. You might open one or two, maybe three, but you really don't want to look at many more than that. Um, also, it's efficient to have everyone on the same platform, right? If you have a large number of drivers and a large number of riders, when a rider is looking for a driver, it's going to allow you to match them with the closest driver and optimize their wait time. And it's going to help your drivers have constant business. They're not going to have to drive around looking for customers that often if you have a lot of riders on your platform. So ideally, in these types of marketplaces, we really want all users on the same network. The problem with this is obvious. If we have a single platform, it's going to generate monopoly power and rents. So if you only in a world in which you only had Uber relative to a world in which you had Uber and Lyft, the prices are the prices you're paying per ride are probably going to be higher if you only had Uber and you didn't have Lyft. Right. So competition is going to benefit users of products in terms of getting better pricing. So ideally, we want a single platform so we can maximize network effects of everyone being on the same platform. But we also want some competition. So we also want competitive pricing. And what we show in this paper is that this can actually be achieved through utility tokens. And the basic, um, so there are going to be three features that are important for something to qualify as a token, which can help solve this problem. It needs to be the sole currency on the platform. So if you think again about a ride sharing platform, essentially you would have a token where tokens are going to be exchanged for rides, right? So it would be essentially the currency on the platform. We require a secondary market for token sales. So again, if this is a ride sharing platform, someone who is looking for a ride is going to be able to go to an exchange, exchange their Bitcoin, Ethereum, USD, whatever have you, for that token, then take that token, pay it to the driver, and the driver then should be able to go back to that secondary market and exchange that token that they received as payment for their right for whatever currency they're going to be able to buy other goods in. And the third thing we require is that these tokens are issued in, a fix, in fixed supply. All three of these are um, sort of typical features of utility token and easily implementable through blockchain technology. So what I'm going to do is just run through, um, the to give you a sense of the basic mechanism, I'm going to run through an incredibly simple example, um, thinking about how tokens can help improve efficiency in a ride sharing platform. So let's say we have two potential riders. Um, who are valuing the same ride, so both of them need to go from point A to point B the same time every day, and they, so they both value this ride, but they value it differently. So the first rider really cares about being able to take the ride, and they value the ride at $15, but the second one cares a little bit less about the ride, so they're only willing to pay $10 for the same ride. So these two potential riders who are looking for rides, and then we have many drivers who can each provide this ride at a cost of $10 um, per ride every day. So the cost of providing the ride is $10. Now let's think about it this for a second. If we don't have a matching problem and we just had a competitive market, what would happen? Essentially, in a competitive market, because we have two people who are looking for drives and willing to pay at least the cost of what it costs the drivers to provide the ride, and we have many, many drivers, where essentially the cost of a ride is just going to be $10, right? The drivers are going to compete with each other um, and they're going to offer their ride for $10. At this price, both riders will be willing to buy a ride and they're going to get a ride every single day. Now, what if the drivers and the riders can't directly match with each other? So let's say we have a hypothetical ride sharing platform, RideX, which can essentially match riders who are looking for rides with drivers who can provide the rides. Now, because RideX um, is sort of handling the matching, the idea is that RideX here is going to be able to determine what price it wants to charge for each ride. So RideX could think, okay, let me charge $10 a ride. 
If I charge $10 a ride, which is the competitive price, I'm gonna be able to sell two rides because both the riders are gonna buy the ride. But then I'm gonna to have to pay the drivers $10 because that's their cost of providing the ride. I can't pay them anything less. They won't agree to provide the ride. So my profit in this case is just gonna be zero. Alternatively, RideX could think, well, I can charge $15 a ride. In this case, I won't sell two rides. I'll only sell the one ride to the rider who values it at $15. I can pay my driver $10 and I can profit five, I can make a profit of $5. Of course, RideX is gonna choose the second option. They're gonna to prefer to make a profit of $5 every day instead of making no profits. Um, and so they're gonna charge $15 a ride, sell one ride a day and make a profit of $5 every day. But there's an, an inefficiency here due to the monopoly power relative to what we saw in the competitive market where remember the price was $10 and two rides were sold every day. So we essentially have a higher price per ride because of the monopoly power and less rides are gonna be sold every single day. So how can a utility token help increase, the effi increase efficiency in this scenario? So let's say right, we have a ride X token. And the idea is that uh, this is gonna operate like a utility token in initial coin offering markets. So riders can buy ride X tokens on an exchange. They'll then take those tokens and pay a driver one ride X token in exchange for the ride. And the driver who gets this RideX token in exchange for the ride should be able to go to the exchange and sell their RideX tokens. Now, if RideX creates two tokens, um, let's think about what happens on the first day. RideX has created two tokens and it owns all the tokens. So it could choose to charge $15 for its tokens on the exchange on day one. Remember, RideX is the only person who owns any tokens, so they essentially get to set the price of tokens on the exchange. If they charge $15 for a token on the first day, only the rider who values the ride at $15 is going to buy the token. So RideX is gonna be able to sell one token. One rider is going, the, the rider who values it at $15, they're gonna go and buy this token they're going to pay their driver the to in the token, and they're going to take their ride. Now, what's going to happen on the second day? RideX still has one token to sell, but the driver who was paid in the token on the first day also has a token that they would like to sell on the exchange. So RideX and the driver are essentially going to compete with each other, and that means RideX will no longer be able to charge $15 for their tokens because there's competition, the exchange price will up for each token is gonna to drop to $10. At $10, both of the potential riders are going to be happy to buy the tokens. They're both gonna take a ride. They're both, um, and they're each gonna pay their driver in the token. On day three, RideX now has no, men, has no more tokens. It spent its two tokens. The two drivers who receive tokens on day two as payment will both sell their tokens on the exchange. Again, because they're two different riders selling their tokens, there's gonna to be competition and the price is going to stay at $10. So the idea here is this is different from when RideX, remember when RideX was working as a monopolist, it was able to charge $15 every single day for a ride. Now RideX can only charge $15 for a token once. So it can profit on day one, but on day two, that token is now in the hands of a driver who's gonna compete with RideX on the exchange, so RideX can no longer keep charging $15. The price is eventually just gonna to fall to the competitive price. The key idea here is that tokens are gonna to create a limited stock of market power. Each time RideX wants to sell some tokens to monetize them, it's essentially, um, it's essentially guaranteeing that it's gonna face subsequent competition. Because each time RideX sells a token, that token is eventually gonna make its way into the hands of a driver who's then going to go on the exchange and compete with RideX. And RideX, because of this, is only going to be able to profit from each token once. 
Not every consumer is going to be able to buy a ride immediately. So in the simple example I walked you through, um, the consumer who valued a ride at $10 wasn't able to start buying rides until the second day. So not every consumer is going to be able to buy a ride immediately, but eventually surplus is going to be maximized and equal to the competitive level. With everyone who values a ride at, at or more than the cost of providing that ride being able to get a ride. Obviously, the full model, which is in our paper, is much more complicated. It's a lot more general, but this example really captures the key intuition of why tokens generate a commitment to eventually getting to a competitive price. Um, so the last thing I really wanted to talk to you about is, well, why choose an initial coin offering? So the example I walked you through, it sort of makes sense that an initial coin off as if you have an initial coin offering, you might be able to disrupt a marketplace which has a monopolist. But let's say an entrepreneur has a new technology. Would they ever choose to have should they ever choose to have an initial coin offering rather than simply operate as a monopolist? So we talk about this question in the paper quite a bit. Um, and the basic idea is that an entrepreneur may actually prefer to commit to competitive pricing through having an initial coin offering rather than operating as a monopolist. And there are a few different reasons that this might be true. Um, so again, if you think about um, you know, the example of Uber versus Lyft, um, if we have two platforms that are competing, um, users are essentially gonna be split across both those platforms, right? And the fact that Uber and Lyft compete with each other likely is going to lower the price of a ride, but we're gonna have this split of users across different platforms. Ideally, we'd all like to be on the same platform, but if we all chose to only use Uber or only use Lyft, in all probability, the price um, that we would be paying for rides would increase, which is why that's sort of not gonna ha happen. But if we have this token as an entrepreneur, it's essentially gonna allow you to commit to keeping the price of your service low. It's gonna allow you to commit to competitive pricing, and this could credibly help you build a bigger network. Um, so this might be one reason that an entrepreneur might actually prefer to have an initial coin offering because it can help discourage entry since you've already committed to lowering the the price of the service or good on your platform, there's not really a reason why an entrant is going to be able to get market share from you. Another potential reason, um, even if only one big company could survive, is that essentially because having tokens is gonna to allow us to get to the competitive equilibrium, total surplus um, with tokens is much higher than the surplus without tokens um, under a simple monopolist. So consumers may actually prefer to, they may want to try to incentivize the entrepreneur to operate with tokens by compensating the entrepreneur by sort of overpaying for tokens during the initial coin offering. So essentially, because we prefer to have competitive pricing going forward, that we want to think about creating incentives for the entrepreneur to actually choose to have an initial coin offering to begin with by sort of compensating them by you know maybe overpaying a little bit for tokens initially to essentially compensate the entrepreneur for the lost rents um, for the rents that they would lose by operating as a monopolist okay um so let me just conclude um in our paper we showed that initial coin offerings might actually be very useful because their mechanism can help improve welfare by generating a commitment to competitive pricing. Um, we're really motivated by the fact that network effects, which is true of so many applications that are widely used these days, give rise to natural monopolies and oligopolies. And potentially, um, we think that potentially our mechanism has big applications and can help entrepreneurs with market power commit to competitive pricing and improving consumer welfare going forward. That's all I have for you. Uh, thank you so much.